Uh, what am I saying? <laughs> this is MPW, 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 the podcast with <laughs> your host, Zylo Aria. Cool. A podcast about music, music production for the everyday musician, where we learn from experienced studio engineers, engineers and, and each other. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the MPW podcast. I'm your host, Zylo Aria, and today we are talking to the incredible Charlotte Wilson. So Charlotte is a platinum-selling K-pop songwriter who has worked with so many amazing artists such as Itzy, Etso, Kang Daniel, and loads more. And she's also the co-founder of music production company, The Hub. So exciting to have you here, Charlotte. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's always great, you know, being asked to do things like this. I rarely get the chance to. So yeah, I hope that, you know, we have a good time. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to be I'm here. I'm sure we will. And I think our audience is very excited to hear from you. So <laughs> I'm really keen to hear about your story and, uh, and everything that you get up to. So you are based in South Korea and it's sort of early evening time for you and yeah. I think you've got a writing session coming up today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have in about two hours, um, I have a session uh, that I need to do with a song, but I can't mention who it's for yet, okay. but <laughs> everybody will see. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited about this one, you know, but yes, it's about 6pm. It's hot outside. I'm dying from the heat. Yeah, it's crazy. But yeah, so... Um, it's literally 24 hours a day, writing songs in the studio. It's crazy all the time. Wow. Okay. Well, I am very excited to hear about your process and, and everything. So interested to know, actually, before we start chatting about that, I'd love to hear a bit more about your uh, journey into where you are today. So obviously, you know, uh, you were raised in the UK, I yeah. believe, and then you've kind of ended up in Korea. And, and how did all that come about for you? Yeah, well, I was born in the UK, but I was actually raised in the Caribbean. So, oh, wow. yeah, <laughs> I was raised in Trinidad and Tobago. So I went there when I was six years old and I came back when I was 16. I came back to the UK or went back to the UK when I was 16. So I spent 10 years there. And for me, that's my entire childhood. Yeah, growing up there was amazing. You know, uh, it was very different from the UK. You know, so different. Like, I remember we didn't even have a cinema. And being in the UK, I was so used to going to the cinema with my mom and everything. And when I got there, I was just like, yeah okay, what is this, mum? I was like, mum, what have you done? I was like, I don't know what this is. But growing up there has influenced yeah. who I am today. So then um, I went back to the UK because my mum was ill. She had lung cancer and it was best to get treatment in the UK. So we came back uh, when I was about 16. And throughout that time, I loved songwriting and... I remember I just wanted to write songs and I always used to record on like a little tape recording and my cousin allowed me to record a song and her boyfriend at the time then put that recording to a beat and that was like my first song so I was really excited about it. I wrote it myself. So yeah, so then I was in the UK and that's when I found out about K-pop and I always wanted to do music so I did sound engineering at college and then from college, I then went to university and I did music entertainment industry management. It's such a long title. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and so that was more behind the scenes and, you know, how to manage and stuff. And so, yeah, so that's basically academically my journey. And along the way, obviously, K-pop became a huge part of my life. So I got into K-pop. It was an accident, actually. Yeah, it was an accident. I was on YouTube looking at a live Usher concert. And Rain was his first act. So, you know, they used to have acts like that would perform before the real star would come out. So Rain was that person. And 
I couldn't. I was like, but what is this music that I don't understand what they're saying, but this thing is like so popping. Like, I was so surprised. I was like, no. And then this man's so handsome. Why is he so handsome? I can't understand it. But what? <laughs> That's literally the thought process. It was all of that. Right? I was like, no. Oh, awesome. What is this? <laughs> So then I went on YouTube, I was like, okay, let me get rain. And then I found out about everybody else, like TVXQ. Who was big at the Infinite was out, groups like Boyfriend, um, Wonder Boys, Shiny, like all of them were popping at that time. Obviously you had Big Bang and 21 and that. Everyone was popping, I was like, what is this? This is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Okay, <laughs> literally, that's how it was. So that's <laughs> how I got into K-pop. And I, at that time, I didn't know if, like, I didn't think that I could write it. I was just like, yeah, I like to listen to it. And things like, platforms like LimeWire and that was out. So I used to illegally, da- everyone don't illegally download now. That's not good. Don't do that. But back in the day, that's the only way I could get these songs. So I used to illegally download all of them and put it on my little iPod. Boom, that was me. I was happy, right? <laughs> That was it. That was it. So that was my journey into K-pop. It was by accident. And then it was this amazing thing. Yeah. So I think it changed for me during college. I had a a teacher called Stevie V, who was actually a star in the 80s. He wrote songs like Money Talks, um, which was a big 80s song in the UK, especially. And I told him that I wanted to write K-pop. And I made these demos. I think it was on GarageBand. In fact, I don't even know where I made the demos. And they were the worst demos ever. But I made them. <laughs> nice. And he had a publishing company. So I was like, look, can you somehow get these to Korea? Just somehow. He was like, yeah, yeah, I'll give them to some people. Nothing ever happened with those songs, okay? But I still decided to practice. And I just practice and, you know... I just liked writing songs, but at the same time, I listened to a lot of K-pop and stuff. Um, And at that time, I was a mega super fan. What? Mega super fan. And then I, my mum passed away. Kind of, it took me a while to kind of just refocus and stuff about what I wanted to do. So the best thing for me to do, I thought at that time, was just to go to university. So I was still writing in the meantime, but I slowed down a lot. And then when I got to university, I had improved my writing. And obviously by then I now was recording on Logic properly and I had studied and everything and I did more songs and I gave them to my old professor again to give to the publishing company and I got a cut from those songs. Oh, wow. So that actually happened. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It did. It did. I did. I That's just didn't cool. give up. Yeah. I just got better. Yeah. You know, I went back. I was like, okay, these are going to be better now. And they were. And it was a, a group called D Unit. I think they had like a mini album. And I did a song for them. And at that time, I didn't really know K pop acts that much mm. in, in terms of like the new ones, the ones that weren't the biggest, should I say. And then I got some J-pop cuts through him as well. But then I took a huge break because dealing with the death of my mum and everything, it just caught up with me. So I actually took a break for about five years. Wow. Yeah. So I didn't write. I didn't do anything. I just took a huge break for five years. And then I decided to pick it up again in 2017. And then this is where the real graft started. And so from 2017, um, I just wrote and decided to figure out, you know, what my sound was. I wrote and recorded. Um, My natural voice isn't necessarily K-pop. So then I had to learn to perform a certain way and, you know, kind of get that K-pop sound, should I say. And I decided, okay to increase my chances of, you know, getting cuts with groups. I wanted to find team members because I used to write a lot of male songs as well, like loads of male songs, but they preferred male singers. 
to sing the demos. So then I wanted to find a male singer and then another female singer. So then 2017, I didn't get one cut. I grafted, I got rejected, 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 rejected. Okay. And I was like, in my head, I just remember saying, okay, look, it's just not my time yet. Let me just keep my head down and keep doing it. Right. And then 2018, I found my team members. So it was Frankie Day and Jacob Aaron. And they are both really dope writers and singers. I decided, okay, now I can write male tracks and female tracks. You know, Frankie's got an amazing voice. So does Jacob. And the three of us, you know, we just managed to just work really well together. And so that's when we cut the boys. Butterfly. And that, that, when we finished writing that song, because we wrote it together, I just remember feeling so, like, wow. I've, like, I can't believe that I found this singer and that I'm getting to do this. And, oh, my gosh. And yeah, that song was cut pretty quickly after we wrote it and sent it in and that's when I knew okay I'm just not gonna give up I'm just gonna do this I'm just gonna keep like I'm not gonna give up everyone's gonna tell you no it doesn't matter so then I just kept writing and writing in the meantime other publishers and stuff started to approach me and send me you know different leads and stuff for groups and I would just write to all of them I'd literally write to all of them. That's how Itsy Not Shy came about. I worked full time, nine to five, and wrote at night and on the weekends for years. And the publisher at the time was one that I um, worked with. I worked with a couple and that was one. And he sent me a lead and this was at like 4 p.m. I finished work at 7 p.m. So my manager at the time, I'll always thank him. He let me go home early because he knew songwriting was my thing. So I got the lead and it was for Itzy. Now, just to rewind about how Not Shy came about, I had come to Korea. I flew to Korea, I think, twice or three times prior to Not Shy to just come and do camps and stuff. And this studio that I'm in now... Itzy recorded their first and second albums in. So I got to meet them and I thought they were dope. So I think they, this was after Dala Dala. So I think this was around maybe Icy. Yeah, it was Icy, right? And I remember thinking, will I ever write for these girls? Like, I'm just never going to do it. Like, I remember thinking, how am I going to do this? I just don't know. They don't know who I am. At this point, I'm no one, but I'm going to one day write for them. So then ever since an Itzy lead came out, I was like, I'm never going to give up. Just try it. Just try it. Just try it. So then fast forward to when I'm given this, hands down, I was going to do it. I was literally going to do it. So I got sent it and I rushed home, left home early. Like I left home at four, I think, or 4.30. I came home. And I hadn't heard the track yet, but I just immediately said yes. I had 48 hours to get it back. So I had two days, or under two days, actually. It was like a day and a half to get wow. the whole song back to them. Wow. Fully done. Crazy. Yeah. I, I, don't, I just don't even know what was in my mind at the time, but I just knew, okay, yeah. I just have to do this. And when I heard the track, I instantly knew, okay, cool, you got this. I just knew. I had got it, like, I'm going to write this. And I wrote it in about an hour. Yeah, everything laid down. It just naturally flowed. All my first takes, my first ideas are the melodies that are in Not Shy. I didn't change them. I just went with it. I just, it was my gut. I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. And then I kept it. And then at that time I was going to ask Frankie to sing it for me because I liked Frankie's voice better than mine it's a lot smoother and Frankie was sick so I had to do it so with Not Shy I had to slow the track down and right. sing it and then when okay. I sped it up it was pitched up amazing so that's okay. how that yeah that's how I get my K-pop vocals I slow the track down because my, my vocals are a lot lower. Because I can do boy group demos. 
wow, girl group demos, so interesting. right? So, mm. and I recently learned how to do it as well. But I was like, oh, man, let me just slow it down real quick. They won't even know. They won't know. So I wrote the whole thing. Um, Not Shy wasn't called Not Shy at the time. It was called Big Boots. So it was actually, so instead of saying Not Shy, Not Me, it was like Big Boots, Big R. Uh. It was actually, it was, it was kind of PG, no, it was kind of rated R, the original version. Right, okay? interesting. Okay. And we'll, just, <laughs> we'll just keep it as that. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, many people don't know it was rated R, the original version. Okay, so. Interesting, yeah, okay. It was, it was the quickest thing to write about. I'm so sorry. At that time, it was the quickest thing to do. So I wrote it all. And then I recorded it in an hour. So I wrote it in one, recorded it in one. So it took me about two and a half hours to do the whole thing. And this was the first time I just thought, ah, just send it. Just It's the best you can do, just send it. And that song, it took a year and a half before they picked it up. And the group Nizzy U was supposed to take it, but they, they held it. So when, I don't know, just for everyone that's listening, when a song is held, it means they're considering taking the song, but it's not a definite yet. And so it was held and then they let it go. And I think Icy came out and I remember I was like, oh, why did this song come out? I put Itzy in their chorus. How can they not take this song? I've put Itzy in their chorus. No other song says Itzy in the chorus. Why the hell hasn't this song come out? And I was so depressed. I was like, this isn't going to happen. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I remember being so upset because they were my goal, right? And then, yeah. now Wannabe, I really liked Wannabe, so I wasn't mad. But I see, I was a bit mad because I was like, what is this compared to Not Shy? Okay, I don't like this. But no, I do like I See. Look, Itzy fans, I'm sorry. I like all their songs. And so a year and a half later, now, I get a DM on Instagram. This is during lockdown now. So we've sped up all this way. I get a DM and I'm in the park on a Sunday. I've been drinking a bit, I have, because it's a Sunday. Right, and we was just out in the park. I get a DM from a random person, and it said Kobe, and I recognized the name. I was like, "Oh, this is the producer of Big Boots." Okay, he was like, "Hey, Shah, so I just finished recording with Itzy." I was like, "Do you have the right person? Who is this?" I was like, "What? How could you message me this?" He was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've just finished recording." I'm like, "Recording what?" What are you? I was probably getting ag 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 agitated. Recording yeah. what? Okay. He's like, you wrote Big Boots, right? I was like, yeah. He was like, didn't they tell you that it's it's his new title track? I kid you not. <laughs> I just put the phone down and cried. <laughs> I cried like <laughs> a, a open mouth in <laughs> in like in front of everybody. <laughs> Everyone was like, Charlotte, what's wrong? I was like, it's okay. I was literally, I was, I was crying. And then I calmed down and I messaged him. I was like, I don't believe you. Like, what? I what? And then he was like, yeah, I've got the Korean guide. Let me send it to you. I was like, what? <laughs> just send me the Korean guide then. And I listened to it and then I cried again. Cried, just cried. I've, I was really overwhelmed that I'd set out to do something and I had achieved it. Yeah. That's the process of Not Shy. I got told over DM. I didn't know when it was coming out. But that was because I had pitched to Itzy about 20 times prior to this but I just didn't get give up but then for that song to you know cut and then it be a title I, I couldn't believe that I had achieved what I set out to do it was just yeah but that's the first time I've actually explained that entire process <laughs> wow oh my gosh that that was thrilling for me to hear so I'm so glad you shared that with us that's incredible amazing amazing 
Hi, my name is Marianne, I'm from Newcastle upon Tyne, and this episode is brought to you by MPW Membership. Did you know that all MPW members get access to monthly group catch-up calls with the rest of the MPW community? This is a perfect resource to help keep you focused on your goals and to give you support through your music production journey, no matter what stage you're at. This is a free feature for all MPW members. Take advantage of this awesome feature and so many more using the link musicproductionforwomen.com forward slash membership. How do you feel after that? I mean, like you, you explained you, how you felt during that and how you felt when you heard about that. Yeah. And it's something that you've been working so hard to do 20 times. That is huge. Yes. Uh, to having, you know, pitch something, uh, which I think for our audience, it, it shows how much work has gone behind something like this. And uh, maybe other people don't realize, you know, uh, how much it goes into it. But then you achieved your goal that you've been set out to do. Were you like, what now? Um, like, what do I do? I was overwhelmed. <laughs> Because COVID was going on at the same time and I was really overwhelmed and I knew this this song, um, though I had done songs like Kang Daniel and I'd done Astro, you know, this song really just pushed me more into the songwriting limelight in K-pop. And so at that time I was overwhelmed and I kind of was like, okay, what now in terms of goals? But girl groups, besides Itzy, the Itzy were my only girl group goal. Everybody else was male. So to achieve that, I was kind of like, what now? But things like the hub was, were created. You know, there was so much more going on that I was like, what now? But at the same time, I was so busy with everything else. So at the time I was overwhelmed. Now I just can't believe it. Because when I, I got to Korea, when Not Shy came out, I came in August and it came out in August, I think. Yes. And I remember being in Gangnam and seeing it on a big screen and I couldn't believe that I had created that. You know, there was a whole pop-up shop dedicated to the Not Shy album and I, I, I couldn't believe it. And it was overwhelming, it was. And then when they brought up the English version, I was like, what? <laughs> so it was it was the gift that kept on giving. Wow. Yeah. So um, it was overwhelming. But now I'm like, okay, what else can I do? Okay, I'm going to do something mm. dope. But yeah, that whole process was overwhelming. Um, and I just took a minute to kind of absorb what was going on. Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot. And I was very grateful as well to JYP yeah. and the a and behind it as well for pushing that song and getting it to where it needed to be. And, you know, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was great. Wow. Amazing. So you said you moved in August, August 2020. Yes, yep. So, I mean, that's an you know, interesting decision to make, I guess. Yeah. Obviously, you know, that's your career is sort of starting to flourish and, and you're deciding to move in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, how, what was your thinking process behind that? I wanted to move to Korea about five years prior to actually getting here. And I didn't know how I was going to do it. And I wasn't too sure. I didn't want to come and teach English, but that was the only way or you could study, but I didn't want to do either. And so I wanted to move. And the hub was officially formed actually in 2019. And because it was a joint effort, I wanted to be here anyway. So from 2019, I decided, okay, I'm going to move. And I was supposed to move in 2019, but I just didn't feel like I was ready yet. So we started the process at the beginning of 2020. And then COVID happened. I was in Korea at the beginning of 2020. And then COVID happened. But I was like, nope, this process is going through. I've already told everyone I'm leaving now. My job now I'm leaving. I just, I have to leave. And so I just mentally prepared myself. Okay, you're going to make this move. Um, I knew about Korea. I'd been here multiple times. I understood the culture, you know, and... So my thought process was just like, do it. What's the worst that could happen? You'll just go home, but you have to do it. 
especially in a pandemic now, like, what if the world ends? I was like, I have to go now. So, yeah, I got here and it feels like home. I feel like I made the right decision and I'm really happy that I made the decision as well to just jump and come here. Mm. The process wasn't as lengthy as I thought it would be. I'm here on an entertainment visa. So it's what most of, most idols that aren't native Koreans, that's what they're on. Um, And it's an E6 visa. And it's when a company sponsors you to come here and work in the entertainment industry. Um, So that process took about three months. I think the hardest thing is to get a company to sponsor you to come. But the hub is a company here and before it was the hub, it was U Productions and this studio has been here for more than 15 years. So it was, you know, an easy process. So, yeah, we started the process maybe May or June, June, and I got here in August. Um, So, yeah, it was a... I knew, I just, I was just strong... Minded, I was like, I'm going to get here. And that's basically how I got here. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. That's that's really cool. And you mentioned that you, before that, had done a few writing camps um, and, you know, you've gone to Korea a few, ta- a few times. Was that something that you were invited to do or, like, how, how does someone get into, you know, that kind of thing? Um, so the first one, I actually just paid for myself to come and I set up my first writing camp just with contacts that I made out here and I made them through Instagram. You know, there's loads of producers out here and I just kind of said, okay, I want to come out. And the producers that I reached out to at the time uh, was a producer called uh, Sungwook, but his uh, actual stage name is Aftershock. And he was like, yeah, okay, come. So I actually came with Frankie and um, another team member, Carolyn, and we just came and we came to this studio and we just did our own camp with, you know, songs from Korean producers. So it was nothing special. I wasn't invited. I just came here and did my own thing. But then people heard about it. And then I was invited back again to do a camp here at this studio by Brian Yu, who is my other partner from The Hub. And that was when I got invited and we did another camp and it was myself, Frankie, Jacob, and then a producer that we have called Enan. And we just did a camp again on our own. It wasn't anything special, we just did it. And then we cut all of those songs and then that's when we realised, okay, we really want to establish the hub. And so I didn't actually get invited to song camps. I got invited to one other song camp, and that was in Sweden with a publisher called Starlab. And that was because I found them on Facebook and reached out to them and sent them loads of my songs. (laughs) Right. And then they were like, oh, okay, come, yeah, we're doing a camp, come. And so that's literally how I got invited to camps. I didn't then start getting, get invited to huge camps until after Not Shy. Um, But the hub put on their own camps anyway. We put on major camps here. But yeah, so my, you know, journey into being invited to camps, it was quite recently, actually. I wasn't always invited people didn't really know who I was. So, yeah. That's awesome. I think that's really important for people to hear is that, you know, you don't get invited to things straight away and you need to make your own opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Until there is a time when when people do that. Right. I think, you know, one of the biggest reasons why the hub exists was because I got rejected from everyone. I was like, all right, cool. Well, if you guys don't want me, I'm just going to start my own thing and you guys are going to want me. And everyone that rejected me, I've actually now worked with, but through the hub. So that's why I decided, okay, I'm just going to do it myself because rejection obviously is huge. So, yeah. Uh, Talk me through the hub and what what you do uh, 
through that? Yeah, sure. Um, so the hub is a production company currently. Um, we're going to expand later, but it's a production company based in Korea. So our producers are predominantly Korean, but our songwriters are all foreign. We have about 15 members, songwriters and producers. We write songs, obviously. <laughs> we mm, record yeah. <laughs> the groups. We do backing vocals. We mix. We tune. We do everything. So we try and provide the full package. And we're more of a family than just a production company, you know. Each member I met personally and each member hadn't, besides Jan and Rajan, who had previously done um, Twice Breakthrough, other songs, all the other members hadn't had K-pop cuts before. They were just wow. all good singers and writers, just like how I was, like it just... They they were cool, really good. So we decided to form. So that's basically what the hub is right now. It's a hub of talent. And yeah, we just have fun, try and make good songs that, you know, the groups want to perform and everyone wants to hear. So yeah, that's what we are. Awesome. Awesome. That's it's really cool that, you know, you formed that and uh Yes. I mean, out of rejection in a way. You yeah. Know? And, you know, sometimes the best projects can come from from that. Um, yeah. And Brian, you know, I thank him so much for taking a chance and believing in the vision because I was just a random girl from like the UK, you know, and Brian just stumbled upon me. And then, you know, he was like, yeah, OK, let's do it. And he believed yeah, in the yeah. process. And yeah, now yeah. we're here. So it's literally like, just don't give up. Yeah, there's so many lessons in there. I mean, don't give up. Uh, and also, you know, making your own opportunities. And yeah. The, and the power of social media, you know, it's, uh, you can do so much with it. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's amazing. And another thing that you mentioned, you know, in 2017, you were saying you were kind of pitching, 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 nothing really was sticking. So what was that process like? And who were you pitching to? Because was this the publishing companies that your uh, your kind of tea track? No, had... one of them was Starlab. My main one was Starlab. They're based in Sweden. Um, anyone who's listening, you can just Google Starlab. Like they're a really cool publisher and stuff. And so I was pitching through them. So I was just making my own songs. I wasn't writing songs to what we call briefs where the group send out the kind of song they're kind of looking for, that kind of vibe. I was just writing my own songs and sending them out. And Starlab was just getting cuts. Starlab get more J-pop cuts than K-pop, but they do have many K-pop cuts too. And I was just pitching through them. But I did do a lot of research on the main publishers out there. So every time a song came out, I'd look at the credits, see who that songwriter signed with, and then reach out to them. Mm. But okay. yep. during that time, I also made sure that my demos were clean sounding. See, K-pop demos need to sound like the finished thing. You, sh you need to be able to put them out already. Like, they should be clean. And so during that time, the others that I reached out to, I sent songs to them, but... They were just like, no, we don't think you're ready yet. But Star Lab right. did give me that opportunity to just get my songs out and stuff. And then I just got better, practiced, worked with Frankie and Jacob Moore for different kind of vocals. So the best way to find out about publishers is literally look at the CDs, the back. They show you, it tells you who's published everything. Then go on social media and reach out or go on. They usually you can get their emails online. You know, everything's quite accessible now. But back then it wasn't as accessible. Instagram wasn't a thing. So I literally had to go online and kind of research a lot. I think back then Echo was a major publisher at that time. But hearing the sound of echo and at the stage I was in terms of my songwriting, I knew, okay, I wasn't quite ready yet. So I just looked and then decided to reach out and I got rejected from most. Yeah. So Starlab gave me that opportunity. 
And they're the ones who gave me Not Shy as well. So they came yeah. full circle. Later on, after I had got cuts, they still came, I still, they still sent me the Not Shy lead. And I was like, yeah, of course. Like, you guys gave me that opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. why not? And then, Love that. Yeah. you know? So, yeah, for anybody who's trying to get their songs out to publishers, research, go on social media, DM them, email them, and just send your demos. Mm. Oh, such, such good advice. And I think people should, yeah, kind of get on that exactly as you said. Yeah. So uh, that's awesome. And you mentioned about you kind of writing just songs and sending them into uh, in, into Starlab, but then then you started writing for briefs yes. and, and, and specific artists. So what do you need to think about when you're tailoring a song specifically to an artist? That's a good question. Okay, so if I take Itzy, for example, so I knew it was for them. I knew that they were a group that sang, but they were more like the Spice Girls of Korea. So, you know, they don't have Beyonce vocals, should I say. You know, they're not the Mamma Moos. They're Itzy. And so I knew that, okay, writing for them, I knew that they would have raps, right? I knew that they would have chants, but then I knew that they had like two or three members that would sing as well. So when I wrote Not Shy, I made sure that there were parts for every member to sing. So when I think about writing for a specific group, you know, sometimes you have briefs for Monster X. I know, I know how the Monster X rappers sound, so then I'll try and mimic them. I know usually their top range, and if you don't know their top, a group's top range, you can Google it and it will let you know. So then I know the top note they're going to hit, so then I won't go above it. Sometimes I will just to see if they'll, you know, push themselves. But if not, then <laughs> we'll kind of stay in that range. I will think of the melodies. So when I'm doing a brief for SM, mm. SM has distinct melodies and things they do, like in their pre-chorus. Their pre-chorus is always melodic compared to the verse, which could be swaggy, their verse could just be all rap, but then when they get to their pre-choruses, they have certain chords they use and certain melodies. So it's kind of knowing when you're writing, it's knowing the group and how they sound. So I always think of how they sound, what kind of raps they like to do, how many members they have. Because writing for a group is different than writing for a solo artist. See, because a solo artist needs more time to breathe. So when I wrote um, Runaway for Kang Daniel, that top line is quite spacey because it's only him that can sing it. So he can't have melodies that really overlap each other and are really fast paced because he has to breathe. Whereas Get Away by Very Very, everything's kind of overlappy or Astro's knock is overlappy, it's very fast paced because, you know, there's more members. So there's so many things that I think about, but my main things are how many members do they have? Do they have a rapper? If they have a rapper, there needs to be a rap part. If they don't have a rapper, no rap part. How, if they have like more than three rappers, then about 50% of the song needs to be rap. Their range, you know, and the company they're coming from as well because companies have unique sounds you know if I'm writing a song for YG I know their sound SM I know theirs mm. JYP I know theirs so yeah there's so many things to think about yeah I mean yeah you've given a few there and it really sounds like a lot of research you know before you put pen to paper yes it really is I researched for years like those five years I wasn't writing, I was re I researched because I knew I was going to come back to it. Mm, so mm, I just mm, researched. Yeah. I looked at, you know, the producers that were popping at the time, the sound of K-pop and where they were going and, mm, mm. you know, trying to write songs ahead of the time so that they'll start to get picked up. And there's a couple of songs coming out next year that are were written two, three, four years ago. Wow. 
And wow. at the time, you know, I knew they were ahead of the time, but I thought, let me just write them anyway. But research, it, it starts at research. You don't mm -hmm. have to be the mm -hmm. best. You know, you don't have to be a somebody, but just researching and know who to get to or who to get your stuff to and not mm. giving up, literally, it, it can, yeah, yeah. it works wonders. Amazing. And when you talked about the the five years that you took off, you know, uh, it doesn't really sound like you took it off, by the way, from, <laughs> from everything that you said. But I, I think artists often find when they take time off, there's this massive guilt with um, not doing the thing that you love. And that can be such a hindrance to letting go and being creative. So how did you feel during this time? And did you experience that at all? Yeah, I felt really guilty. I felt like, oh my gosh, all these other foreign writers are now coming up and I'm not doing anything. Um, I felt really depressed, actually, really depressed. I was like, oh my gosh, you've just missed the train. Before, there, there wasn't as many foreign writers, but now... There's like so many and I'm just seeing like all people get all these cuts and, you know, write all these dope songs and I'm working a nine to five and taking a break. So I did feel really guilty, really depressed and I wasn't too sure how I was going to do it, if I'm honest. And I, I'm not too sure what changed my mind and told me, OK, you need to start again. But I just felt like. I always felt like I was meant to do this. I was born to do this. And so I just felt like, okay, you've just done enough now. You just need to get back to what you were trying to do. I do regret taking so much time out, but at the same time, I don't feel like my sound was back then. I feel like my sound is now. I feel like music has developed so much, especially in the Korean market where I don't think my sound was something that was, yeah. I just feel like it's more that now. Fit in that time. Yeah, because mm. my natural, like the inspiration for Not Shy was taken from Missy Elliott and Lizzo. Wow. But about okay. five to seven years ago, well, Lizzo, I didn't even know who she was. And I don't think, yeah, it was different. So... Though taking that time out, I did feel guilty and I felt like so much time had passed me by. I feel like it all happened for a reason. So if there's people out there that aren't doing exactly what they love or what they feel like they weren't meant to do, it's all about timing. It doesn't mean you're not going to get to do it. It just means maybe the time isn't now. Oh, so much wisdom there, Charlotte. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, that that's cool. And going back to your songwriting process, so yeah. this I was meant to start, I mean, ask you about the start, but yeah, we've yeah, just yeah. gone to so many places. But, like, speaking of K-pop specifically, what do you think makes that genre so special and what makes writing K-pop different to writing other things? Okay, so with Western songs, I just feel like it's, it's a lot more boring. It's just, <laughs> it's so, I know, I know, I know. Okay, don't hate me for this, but it's just once you've got your verse and your pre-chorus and your chorus, you're copy and pasting it and then you're doing a bridge if there is a bridge and then that's it. Yeah. That's your song, yeah. okay? <laughs> you're right? Uh -huh. And if, if it's a rap song, it's even worse. Is there even a real pre-chorus? No, it's just... It's there. Whereas K-pop, I feel like what makes K-pop K-pop is the mashup. It's like a ma it's like when you listen to a K-pop song, especially back in the day, it just you thought you could predict where it was going, but then you couldn't. And you're like, what yeah, the right. hell happened to this? This don't even go. I don't even like this song. No, I don't like it. The next day I'm singing it like, yeah, mm, 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 mm. and then <laughs> I've fallen in love with it. The visuals are wicked. The members are pretty and handsome. And then I'm just, um, I'm caught up, you know. But I feel like K-pop differs structure wise. You know, there's a structure that I use a lot. Whereas, you know, first verse is an introduction. So if you start it off with rap, then it's rap followed by a melody. Or if the whole verse is rap, then you have to sing in the pre-chorus. And then you have to kind of either 
go up in the chorus or do a chant in the chorus or some melody. And then when the second verse comes, it starts off with a rap. So it's not a copy and paste from the first verse. You're starting off completely different. And with K-pop, I feel like you don't have to do the same thing you did in the first verse. Mm, okay. Plus you have extended choruses, alternate choruses, dance breaks, mashups in the in the bridge. And you used to have that when NSYNC and, and Backstreet Boys were around, but that was a while ago. So I mm. feel like K-pop the structure really impacts for me it impacts k-pop or makes k-pop mm. what it is um as well as the melodies you know what was the good i remember when i think red velvet's ice cream cake came out was it that song it goes dum 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 da, 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 da. and i remember listening to that song and thinking, damn, these are real K-pop melodies. They're not melodies that are in the Western market. They're really K-pop. And I loved mm, it. Okay. Mm. So I feel like, you know, the melodies that are used are quite K-pop. I think in the Western market, who does that quite well and sounds quite K-pop is Doja Cat at times. She seems to switch things up. And, you know, she obviously she's a rapper and a singer. So what you find is that she incorporates both into her songs. And that's what K-pop does as well. K-pop has rap and it has melody. And so you find that her structures are quite K-pop. And so she sounds more K-pop. That's why I find a lot of her stuff is quite hooky and it stands out to me right now. But as well, musically, I feel like that's what, make K, that's what makes K-pop K-pop. But then visually, you're just on another level. <laughs> All these members, the dance moves, yeah. you know, just everything else that goes into it behind the scenes. Yeah. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Like, it's crazy. And to be part of that process, to see it all happen and it all comes together, it's just crazy. Wow. That would be just uh... You know, I can't even imagine to see something that started off, you know, very much as your creation. Yeah. Becoming this larger than life thing of its own um, yeah. is, is Yeah. And yeah. like <laughs> sometimes the melodies and stuff don't even have words. You just send it yeah. off as like a blabble and it became a thing. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, that actually leads me to... Another question that I wanted to ask you, I mean, you are a foreign songwriter yes. uh, writing for Korean artists. How does lyrics work? And, you know, how do you even start that process? Did you have to learn the language? Um, no, no, not at all. So most times on credits, you'll see the foreign writers, but you'll also see a lyricist. And that's usually a Korean person. And that's because they write the lyrics. They, yeah. They write the lyrics. And the same way when a, a, um, a company sends out a brief, different writers are going to write for that brief. It's the same with lyricists. Different lyricists will write lyrics for that one song and pitch their lyrics. And the company decides, okay, this is a good concept. Let's go with that. So when I write lyrics, there's always a concept anyway because it's my goal for the group to take that concept but depending on how the Korean lyrics fit, it may not, you know, it, the concept may change. So for me, lyrics, they always make sense in English. Sometimes they don't. If, if I just have to fill in the rap real quick it, with words that sound good phonetically. So what I try and do when writing lyrics, I try and mimic the sound of Korean language, but with English lyrics. So... I won't say words, you know, that they can't say because the Korean language, um, for example, L's and R's, they're the same. So, you know, I right. won't write lyrics where it will be difficult if they do keep the Korean lyric, you know, difficult for them to say. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to choose really difficult words. I'm going to try and keep the hook catchy and something that they can keep if they want to and sing in English. So that's always my focus with lyrics. Something easy, 
but phonetically mimics Korean, but then sticks to the concept as well. Mm. Okay, okay. Right, and so in a in a song like Not Shy, for example, how much of your original lyrics were kept or, or was it completely changed? The whole thing was changed. I think, like... Interesting, right. No, they, they did keep some. They did keep some. They kept about 2% of them. That was it. Right. Okay. Because, okay. like I said, the song's rated R, mm. so you can't... <laughs> they can't have them lyrics in there. <laughs> yeah, And yeah, so... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they kept some of the lyrics, but like 2% and that was it. But in Very Very's Getaway, they kept more of the lyrics. Or Getaway was called Runaway. And they kept a good amount of those lyrics there. And Runaway was about COVID. It was our first session during the lockdown. And we just wanted to run away from everything that was popping off because it was just too much. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it was about getting away. So they kept a lot of the lyrics anyway. And they replaced the word run away with get away. Right. Okay, cool. Yeah, interesting. Interesting to know. So what would you say has been your greatest challenge to date, Charlotte? Ooh, in the K-pop industry. Ooh, you know what? Competition. The competition, I think for me. My greatest challenge is actually the competition. There's so much out here. Like, we're talking thousands of people doing what I do. Going for the same brief that I'm going for. Doing the same thing. For Not Shy, all my friends submitted. And I heard all of their songs and they were amazing. And I remember Big Boots and I remember thinking they ain't going to cut this because everyone else's song is so much better. Wow. What's going on? And a good friend of mine, Anna Timgren, I heard her demo and she's amazing. And I remember thinking, bro, I got no hope. Just none. It just don't even, you just, you, you don't have any. Competition is, has been the biggest thing. Because it's like you have to work, you have to go above and beyond. You have to work nonstop. You know, I don't get, I don't really get writer's block. So that hasn't been a thing for me. You know, building contacts and stuff, that wasn't an issue. The competition for me and keeping myself, you know, not psyching myself out and thinking oh I can't do this or that melody's you know bad or something like that that's mm-hmm. been my biggest struggle personally and the competition is fierce there's some amazing writers out here so yeah that's been the biggest struggle for me wow and do you have any process that you go through to not let that overwhelm you or completely overcome you I just try and get a good song. A good song is a good song, right? No matter who you send it to, if it can get to the group's A&R, a good song is a good song. So I just try and focus on making a good song. And if that group doesn't take it, another group will, if it's a good song. Or maybe it's not that time for that song to be out. Just, yeah, I just try and say focus on a good song. Um, And, yeah, like, I think that's the best thing. Yeah. Cool. And if you have one piece of advice that you could give someone starting out in this career, what would you tell them? This is going to sound so cliche, right? And I remember I was told this, but don't give up. Like, don't. If they tell you no, okay, go to the next person. If they tell you no, then maybe it's not your time, okay? But work on getting your sound clean. Know what who you want to write for know who you want to get to and just don't give up see people will tell you no they'll tell you no but they will tell you yes eventually yeah just don't give up because I didn't give up I literally didn't give up and you know the Not Shy album all them people that were on all the album songs I know all of them and at one point I wanted to work with all of them And I couldn't believe that I shared the same album with them. Amazing. Yeah. And I just didn't give up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's the biggest piece of advice. Just don't 
believe in yourself and don't give up. Just keep doing it. Keep your head down. Don't look at what other people are doing. If that they're having success at a certain point, be happy for them. It's their time. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, that's mm-hmm. them. Because once you do get the success... The pressure doesn't go away. Now you're pressured to keep that success rolling and outdo yourself. Mm, so, yeah, just don't give up. I think that's... Um... No, it's good. It's good. It's, uh, I think, honest advice and, and what people need to hear most. So, so yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's... All right. Well, that is kind of the end of my questions. We do... We had loads... And loads of questions from our audience for you, Charlotte. So I had to bring them in because otherwise we could be chatting for another whole hour yeah. easily. So um, I've, I've cut it down to two. So there's one from Gabby Morris. So she asked, what is your process of songwriting and is there a certain routine that you use every time or is it completely different all the time? Mm. So I'm actually a freestyle writer. So I can hear a beat and just think of melodies. And so I'll just put the melodies down. When I hear the beat, the beat will kind of give me like a concept. It will give me like, how how do I feel? Is this a dangerous sounding kind of mysterious beat? You know, is it? So I kind of get a feel from the, the instrumental that I'm given. And then I just put down melodies. So I'm actually a freestyler. That is my process. Like everybody knows like if we're having a camp and everyone's stuck on a melody, melody, they're like, okay, bring Charlotte in. She's just going to freestyle and just figure it out in her head. And that's what yeah. I do. So that's my process. Yeah. I'll get a beat. I'll listen to it first. I'll be like, all right, cool. And then I'll just freestyle on it. And then once I've freestyled, I'll kind of chop and put together. And I'm like, okay, this is how it needs to go. It's weird but when I listen to the music, I can kind of see it. I don't know how to explain it. So in my head, I kind of know where that something needs to be sung in falsetto or how it needs to be sung or, um, yeah, it's just, it's yeah. in my head. I literally just go and it's like that. And I have, you know, other friends who actually have to really concentrate and sit down and, you know, think of melodies and do that. But... Mm-hmm. I'm the opposite. I literally just come up with melodies on the spot and just usually roll with it and see where it takes me. And then once I listen to it, if I feel like, you know, mm, okay, a rap needs to go there, that sounds like that melody there, I then start cleaning up and start defining each section. Mm. Okay, okay. And, I mean, you say that it just comes to you, but you didn't, kind of wake up like that one day you know it it, do you think that it kind of came from how much of this music you were listening and how much kind of you were surrounding yourself by it well yeah but at the same time no so I've always done that with melodies so ever since I was young I could always just run on a track I think the first time I did it I was like 10 as in the Caribbean And my mum always played music, yeah. She always played reggae music. And sometimes reggae music was just the instrumental. And you'd have different reggae artists on one instrumental, right? But sometimes the instrumental used to be included in the tape. That's how long ago it was tape, you know. And then I used to just come up with melody ideas over the tape and just freestyle, you know. And so I've always been able to do that. So now fast forward I do it but then I think you're right in saying that the research and everything has helped and has really kind of made me look at what melodies to do Mm, 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 you know mm, yeah because sometimes melodies are too western or too boring or you know just won't fit so it kind of really does all complement itself like your research, you know, knowing how many members, everything kind of comes full circle. So for me, yeah. my initial start on a track is freestyle, but then I have to break it down and structure it out. Love it. Love it. So last question by JoJ. She said, who is your next favourite K-pop group that you want to write Ooh, for? Okay, that's hard. <laughs> 
I do like 80s a lot, okay? 80s are really dope and I do want to write for them. I do want to write for Treasure as well because our team has done them before but I wasn't involved in that song but I do want to write for them. Girl groups, oh, Asper would be good. I like Asper's sound, they're all right. And there's some that I can't mention but I'd really love to write for them. (laughs) And when they come out... Everyone Just remember, yeah, everyone's going to know. They will, because they're dope, all right? But, oh, who else? I do like the boys. I do want to write for them again. Nice. Ah, oh, amazing. And <laughs> I'm sure you will make all of that happen, Charlotte, with your... Fingers crossed. ...intense determination. So that's, uh, yeah, amazing. So I, in the interest of letting you go and not taking up loads more of your time, I will leave it there. But um, so you've got this uh, writing session coming up. Do you, do you do anything to prepare or you just kind of go straight into it? Well, I kind of, I have the instrumental already. So I'm going to just kind of freestyle on it and see. The company have kind of said what they want and I'm just going to go with it and see where it goes. But when it comes out, you guys remember this a podcast, okay? Because you're going to see it and you're going to be like, oh, that's the song she was talking about. Okay, cool. But it's not till next year. So, I mean, it's kind of far. We'll, we'll, we'll recirculate this. And <laughs> we'll be like, we knew. We got the first <laughs> heads up. So, yeah, special, special audience right here. So that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Well, it's been such a pleasure, Charlotte. Yes. And loved kind of deep diving into the k-pop world with you and and yeah and i'm sure our audience is going to very much enjoy hearing all your insights so thank Thank you. you so much for having me um i've really enjoyed it just sharing you know my little bit of wisdom hopefully somebody out there you know can just you know take it and yeah dominate but yeah no i'm so thankful uh thank you for the opportunity and stuff yeah i really appreciate it absolute pleasure been so so lovely so um i'll let you get to your writing session and have a great evening thank you bye bye